Okay, I think we've got uh, reasonable numbers coming in, 65 already. So um, just to, to kick things off, um, thanks everybody for joining. This is uh, uh, Constructing Debate, uh, jointly hosted with Engineers Ireland uh, webinar. And the topic is, can modern methods of construction deliver housing targets? My name is Daniel McCrum. I'm an assistant professor in the School of Civil Engineering in University College Dublin. I'm also the director of the Modern Methods of Construction uh, Research Group in UCD. Um, as part of Construct Innovate, I lead one of the, the five main uh, theme challenges around productivity, affordability, and cost. And this is kind of the genesis of this um, webinar, I suppose. I'd like to firstly um, um, thank all the speakers as well, and I'll introduce them there, but thank them for taking their time and, and uh, providing their expertise today. So the running order will be, um, uh, first of the Declan Hughes, who's the Assistant Secretary in the Department of Enterprise, Trade and Employment. And it'll be Dr. Magdalena Hadjikovic, the Director of Construct Innovate, and James Young, who's Director of Engineering Services at Evolution Innovation, followed by Brian Kennedy, Managing Director of Vision Built. And then uh, there'll be Sean Balf, uh, followed by Pat Carolan. So Sean is Director of Agreement um, at the National Standards Authority of Ireland. And Pat is, the, um, is a Standards Officer at the National Standards Authority of Ireland. Then we have Connor Taff, who is Managing Director of Home Bond, followed by James Duncan, Head of Construction and Environment at the Building Research Establishment in the UK. Finally, Sean Downey who's Director of Specialist Contracting at the Construction Industry Federation, um, will kind of chair a question and answer session. So if you're interested along the way or have any questions, um, there's a QA and a uh, button you can click on. Um, so add in your questions as we go along, or you can type them in live at the end and we'll answer them. So I'll hand over now to Declan, if Declan can give a brief introduction. Thanks very much, Daniel, and good morning, everybody. I'm delighted to see some large numbers uh, joining us this morning for this uh, webinar. Um, as Daniel said, my name is Declan Hughes. I head up the Investment and Innovation uh, Division in the Department of Enterprise, Trade and Employment. And uh, as I'll outline to you, we see modern methods of construction as hugely transformative for the residential construction sector, as we have seen its adoption and implementation in the commercial industrial sector really putting us at the forefront of uh, delivery of construction uh, and development projects um, on, on a global scale. Um, and I'm delighted that this is the first, I think it's the first uh, event for the new Construction Technology Centre for Construct Innovate, and I'll give a little bit, little bit of background on that. Um, and certainly the outputs from this morning's webinar will support the important work of Construct Innovate as it develops its own work program um, for the future. Uh, the Construct Innovate Technology Centre is an ambitious project with a vision to make Ireland a global research and innovation leader for sustainable construction and built environment technology, with a particular focus in the first instance on residential construction as part of uh, Housing for All. And that's why in uh, July of this year, the Taunashta and Minister for Enterprise, Trade and Employment announced funding of 5 million for Construct Innovate over five years to establish a technology centre to accelerate research and innovation within construction and built environment, but bringing together qualified researchers, the CTZ would provide a unique ecosystem for collaboration in the sector with, uh, with GE and with the wide range of, of industry players. Um, as you probably know, and you'll hear later from Magda, it's hosted, uh, the technology centre is hosted by consortium led by University of Galway and involving UCC, UCD, TCD, the Irish Green uh, Building Council and is overseen by Enterprise Ireland which is an agency um, of the Department of Enterprise. It's one of the measures we are putting in place under Housing for All to drive innovation and productivity in the construction sector and again at the outset I want to thank all my colleagues in, in Enterprise Ireland for uh, working with uh, the consortium to bring this to fruition um, at such um, uh, at such a short notice, but in, in, in a very efficient uh, way. Uh, and indeed, the um, Construct Innovate is a great addition to Enterprise Ireland's existing technology centre program, which underpins Irish research, development, innovation capabilities across a whole range of areas in order to give competitive advantage to Irish firms by developing cutting edge products and services, um, and to ensure that they're uh, we, can, we can bring those to market quickly, both in Ireland and internationally. 
I should say at the outset, Construct Innovate is one of a number of initiatives that the government is progressing as part of Housing for All um, uh, under the Modern Methods of Construction uh, uh, team and initiatives. Um, I'm happy to take questions on those later on, but the other initiatives that we are progressing are a new demonstration park for Modern Methods of Construction in Mount Lucas, and we have to hope to have a number of sites uh, and, and, uh, and housing types uh, on display uh, during next year, and that's operated by the Shoffley ETB uh, on the Department of uh, Further and Higher Education, SOLUS. Um, we're also further expanding the National Construction Technology and Training Centre at Mount Lucas, that's again operated by the Shoffley ET, uh, Education Training Board. We have a new initiative uh, which was launched uh, a number of weeks ago uh, by the Department of Public Expenditure and Reform on Build uh, Digital, uh, which is about promoting uh, building information uh, modeling uh, and management systems. Um, and again, we can hear about that uh, from some of our colleagues later. Uh, in addition, Enterprise Ireland has a whole suite of supports now available to companies in the residential construction sector under the theme of Build to Innovate. Um, and then I'm delighted that uh, colleagues from NSAI are also joining us this morning uh, to outline some of the works that they are doing around National Standards uh, Authority NSAI work, but also particularly around argument and, and standards for, uh, for modern methods. So to bring all that together, we've also established a new interdepartmental group uh, which combines Department of Housing, Department of Enterprise, um, uh, Department of Public Expenditure, uh, Department of uh, Higher Education, Further Education, and Enterprise Ireland, the OGP, and others uh, to coordinate on uh, all of those activities and provide leadership around multi uh, modern methods of construction. And we meet on a monthly basis. Um, and at this stage, I'd also like to acknowledge the work that others, including Engineers Ireland, um, and uh, thanks again to Engineers Ireland West for organizing this. But um, that Engineers Ireland and Royal Irish Academy, or sorry, the uh, Institute of Architects and others are, are, uh, are developing around modern methods. And you may have seen earlier this month uh, the launch of new guidelines from, um, uh, from the uh, RAAI in relation to uh, design for manufacture and uh, for assembly. Um, in, in essence, what we're trying to do is ensure that we can have the deepest connections between advances in science and technology. Um, for the benefit of the construction sector, all the way through from design through to delivery, using state-of-the-art analytical tools and technology advances, and to deliver productivity costs and time savings estimated at up between 20 to 40 percent. Um, the, uh, the benefits of continued integration of new technologies and of new processes, of course, are in evidence in terms of what we're doing right across the uh, commercial and, and industrial sector. And as I said, that is uh, providing the leadership uh, and uh, strong reputation for Ireland um, in the commercial and industrial sector, both in terms of attracting new FDI to Ireland, uh, but also in terms of for Irish companies uh, in the commercial and industrial sector who are um, uh, trading internationally and, and winning successfully uh, co contracts abroad. Before we started the, uh, the work on the Construction Technology Centre and Construct Innovate, as, as, it's, as it's now uh, morphed into, we commissioned through Enterprise Ireland, uh, Ernest and Young, to undertake a survey of what current adoption was of MMC and what the, uh, what, what the potential app applications would be. And I have to say, overall, there was a, there was a high level of awareness of modern methods of, of, of construction. Um, and indeed, there is um, a growing uh, level of adoption of modern methods. So we found that about a third of companies, uh, when we surveyed them in terms of contractors and in the professions, about a third of companies were using sub-assemblies and components, panelized systems and volumetric and modular um, uh, uh, inputs, and a fifth were using bathroom and, and kitchen pods, and we see that right across in particular in the department side. On business information modeling on BIM, AEY found that while it's in, in, uh, being increasingly used, uh, and indeed, as many of you know, the end, uh, National Development Finance Agency has been using BIM in PPP projects for over a, de a decade. The sophistication of use is not great. Uh, a number of reasons that were identified for lack of take for lack of use um, were lack of in-house knowledge, uh, no client demand, and lack of training. And that's where the Build uh, Digital in Initiative uh, will come in on automation. Ernest and Young, which again is another component of, um, uh, of MMC, Ernest and Young estimate that 40% of industry are not using any automated technology. The other 60% that are using uh, automation 
We use them principally for electronic systems, for document management, for e-procurement, mobile technologies and tracking systems. And on sustainability, and I think you're all aware of this, uh, Ernest Young did highlight that in, in their, in, as part of the survey that there's a huge culture shift is needed to decarbonize construction processes, to, to tackle the full carbon life cycle of buildings and to maintain and to mainstream MNC and manufacture and sustainable manufactured materials. But what they did conclude and they told us was that the sector is up for it uh, and is up for the challenge with most firms recognizing that sustainability and energy and innovative and sustainable materials and the whole life performance of buildings um, will be up their top priorities and greatest importance uh, going forward. So um, it's, it's a, and I think as we were going to hear from, from ICTA, it's exciting to see the range of technologies and the range of thematic areas that the construction uh, innovation will be focusing on. Everything from prefabrication and modular uh, construction through to advancement of building materials, 3D printing and additive manufacturing, autonomous construction, augmented reality and visualization and big data, um, and, and wireless monitoring and uh, connected equipment, uh, 3D scanning, um, and as I said, uh, and, and BIM. And these are all areas where we have um, a level of research and technology development and sophistication um, in SF Science Foundation Ireland research centres and also in Enterprise Ireland technology centres and right across our uh, uh, universities and technology university and further education sector. So the idea of the Construct Innovate as a consortium is to bring all those together um, around a common agreed uh, agenda for uh, all players in the value, uh, in the construction uh, value chain and particularly in terms of in the housing value chain. And that's why your input today um, is, is so important to helping to shape uh, that, that agenda. And um, what we did uh, find was, uh, as I said, in terms of you know, about a third of companies uh, are currently using MMC, but actually a very high um, interest and aptitude and, uh, uh, in developing and adopting MMC in the future, with nine out of 10 um, uh, of the respondents to the survey saying that uh, they expected that MMC would be of great or very great importance into the future. Um, uh, but the key ask uh, from the system was for collaboration and for knowledge sharing and for communities of interest. Uh, to make this happen and hence why this seminar with Engineers Ireland um, is, is so important and, uh, and, and, and so useful as, as a first step. And, and essentially why we're looking for your input uh, into defining the specific areas where the construct innovation uh, can have the biggest impact um, and what are the common needs across the entire sector. Um, and we certainly will look forward to, uh, to discussion on that. Uh, we do see it as a platform for collaboration between industry and researchers and the public policy system, uh, which can hopefully for the future enable disruptive and collaborative processes uh, to be trialed, developed and tested, provide world-class research expertise, enable access to state-of-the-art research and testing facilities, create pathways for access for all sizes of, of, of companies and capture indigenous and export-oriented markets, highlight future skill opportunities. And as I said, we've had really strong collaborations with SULUS and with the higher and further education sector in that retraining and reskilling and upskilling uh, of the existing workforce of nearly 160,000 uh, in the sector, um, and then enable open source data and uh, in, in, in information uh, sharing. And I think what uh, another strength of the Construct Innovate um, uh, Center is just a diverse industry membership will give. Uh, access to a range of knowledge um, from multiple application and technology areas across the whole value chain, uh, which would not otherwise be available to individual companies. So this is almost a first uh, for many in the sectors to have that level of engagement and interaction. But as Daniel said, mentioned at the beginning, this is also about driving down costs, increasing productivity and improving quality um, and reliability across the, uh, the construction sector. Construction sector is a hugely important part of the Irish economy. Um, in terms of our economic and social infrastructure. Um, and so it's really important to sustaining growth and competitiveness and to attracting FDI uh, in, in, into the future. Um, but critically, uh, our initial focus is on, on delivery of the housing for all and addressing that, that, that housing um, challenge. We also see the Construct Innovate Centre uh, as fitting into a wider objectives of making the construction sector an attractive career choice and sustainable industry can not only deliver the ambitious targets for home delivery on the government's um, uh, housing for all strategy, but also as thriving sector of the Irish economy. 
I'm looking forward to the discussion. I hope we'll have a fruitful engagement uh, across the morning um, and indeed many successful and fruitful collaborations into the future. So thanks again and uh, look forward to the discussion. I'll hand over to Magda now. Thank you. Thanks very much, Declan. Yeah, yeah, we can hand over to, to Magda now. Thanks, Dan, and thanks, uh, Declan. Uh, just before we start, before I start introducing Construct Innovate, I want to give you a little warm up. So for all our participants to uh, to give to to take out your uh, your phones or your uh, laptops and just give us a little feedback. So just one second, sharing this here. So this is just to, to get to know you, where you're coming from, uh, what is your experience with the modern methods of construction. Um, so we'll start with the, with the first question, if you can just type in uh, where you are joining us from today. Um, if you go, you can go to uh, vivox.app uh, with this ID, or you can just scan the, the, the barcode that you can see, uh, the QR code that you can see here on the screen. Uh, and then um, you will be brought directly into the into the live call where we can see where you're coming from. So it will be very useful for us to to see what kind of audience we have today. Uh, we can see that the majority of people are coming from Dublin. Dublin is very strong and big, but oh, nice uh, a little um, a little diversity here. So we have people from London, from Galway, from Cork. Uh, Dublin again, Carlo, Mullingar, Killarney, fantastic. So it's great, uh, you know, we appreciate you taking the time to join us today. Uh, you know, we, we have some excellent presentations ready uh, from our speakers, but it's, it's brilliant to, you know, to start the discussion going on the modern methods of construction um, and hear what kind of questions or concerns you may have, because that will all feed into um, into the work of Construct Innovate. Okay, fantastic. Uh, so let's move on to the next question. Uh, what is your discipline? And you can see here a list of different disciplines, architecture, contracting, certification, standardization, education, engineering, uh, insurance, material or system development, quantity surveying, research innovation, or any other. So if you could select one of those uh, or two, if you're aligned to two, uh, see that the majority, vast majority is coming from engineering. Uh, we can see some research and innovation, uh, material and system development, contracting, uh, brilliant. Okay, so I think we can move on to the next question how would you describe your level of knowledge of modern methods of construction uh, so if you select one that means that you have no knowledge of mmc and five you would consider yourself as an expert very good so it's kind of a moderate uh, knowledge the majority oh let's see it's changing now so hopefully after the webinar today, that will that will change a little bit. You will feel like you're a little more expert on this. Okay, fantastic. Thank you. Uh, I think I have one more. Uh, have you ever worked on a project that used modern methods of construction and you can select yes, no, or you may not know if you did. See that the over half of the participants have worked, have used MMC or worked on a project that involved MMC. Fantastic. Okay. And one more, what challenges do you see for MMC to deliver housing targets? So uh, you can just type in uh, your answers there and we will have a uh, uh, cloud, uh, word cloud generated, labor supply, collaboration, planning process, workforce, cost of material, cost, cost seems to be a, an important one, um, scale of manufacturing, 
certification, capital funding, uh, procurement, lack of knowledge, lifespan, cost versus competition. Oh, that's very, I can see that everyone is warmed up now because the, the word cloud is, is growing bigger and bigger. Fantastic. Certification and cost very, uh, and procurement, the major ones that are, that are showing up here. Brilliant. Thank you very much. Uh, and, uh, and we have one more. What opportunities arise for MMC in Ireland? And again, you can type in your uh, answers and we'll, we'll see the, uh, the word count created housing, yeah, the big, big thing, the housing uh, crisis, addressing housing for all, speed of delivery, modular homes, new housing, uh, better quality, world leader in MMC, um, construction times, rapid build, fantastic, residential again, so a lot um, <clears throat> linked to housing, um, education, Productivity, sustainability, brilliant. Speed of delivery, uh, fantastic. Okay, brilliant. Thank you very much. I think this is the last one. Yeah, super. Uh, so I'll now switch to the presentation. Hopefully you can see the slide. Um, so, uh, today, I want to introduce Construct Innovate, which is the National Center of Excellence for Research and Innovation in Construction and Built Environment Technology, uh, which I'm developing with my colleague, Professor Jamie Goggins at the University of Galway and colleagues in the Construct Innovate Consortium. Here are some uh, international values from the peer-reviewed publications on the construction worldwide. Um, in Ireland, the construction industry is worth about 10% of the economy, um, and in, it is forecasted that in 2022, this year, the investment in building and construction in Ireland will be about 32 billion euro. And about half of this uh, forms the investment under the National Development Plan. So the construction is a very important sector that creates new jobs, it drives economic growth, provides solutions for social, uh, climate, and, and energy challenges. However, the Irish construction sector has its own challenges, and uh, those include its cyclical nature, where the value of the output in the industry has fluctuated significantly. For example, uh, it was uh, 20 point, uh, just over 20% uh, of GDP in 2006, and it fell to just over 5% in 2012. Uh, the industry is very fragmented, so uh, about 93% of companies employ less than six people. So we really have, majority are the micro enterprises in the construction sector. Uh, and finally, there is a low productivity, uh, which it is significantly lower uh, than in many other Western countries. Uh, and it remains at the same level. It's not really, uh, the productivity is not really increasing. And those are the findings of the, of the reports that have been done previously by the construction sector group and other associations in the construction sector, uh, which were mentioned by Declan in this presentation as well. Um, so the establishment of, the, of Construct Innovate aligns very well with the, with the government strategies and plans, uh, and that the, the initiative supports Project Ireland 2040, and it is integral uh, and collaborative part of the, of the work of the construction sector group, and in particular, the innovation and digital adoption uh, subgroup. So what is Construct Innovate? Uh, the center consists of five partner institutions with full support from six SFI centers uh, that are hosted at our institutions. So the, the five partner institutions are the University of Galway, Trinity College Dublin, University College Dublin, University College Cork, and the Irish Green Building Council. Uh, we also have strong commitment and engagement from key international players in the construction innovation sector. 
Um, and Declan mentioned that the, the, the vision of the center is to make Ireland a global research and innovation leader uh, for sustainable construction um, and built environment technology. Um, so our consortium partners have uh, extremely strong track record in research and innovation. And we have uh, a team of over 60 funded investigators with expertise in the main areas of digital adoption, modern methods of construction and sustainability. Uh, and those investigators, those teams, research teams are organized under five pillars of productivity, affordability and cost, quality and safety, sustainability, skills and training and collaboration. The five pillars uh, and the thematic working groups are the fundamental part of Construct Innovate. So we have the, the team of our uh, consortium partners uh, who are academics and research staff uh, active in construction related research. Uh, and we have aligned them to the, to the working groups. However, the, the working groups will be led by Construct Innovate members. It's a bottom up approach uh, our members have a very uh, strong voice. So the initial working groups will focus on 10 most promising technologies uh, to improve engineering and construction. And those were identified by the, by the CIF research needs analysis report, but the groups will be updated following consultation with our members. So once we start members onboarding and they will form working groups and they will identify uh, their challenges or the challenges in the sector and the best uh, ways to address uh, those challenges. So Construct Innovate will be a platform or is a platform for collaboration. Uh, the membership of the center will be open to all construction or built environment stakeholders who have interest in, in the development of construction technology expertise in Ireland. And our members will decide which activities are beneficial to the sector uh, and that will prevent the platform from becoming a competitor to any uh, research performing organizations, research technology organizations, clusters, or private companies. Uh, from the outset, uh, the center will focus on addressing the challenges of the housing crisis, and Declan mentioned that, but it will be followed by addressing other strategic outcomes identified uh, by the Irish government and construction sector stakeholders. Uh, the center will plan its focus uh, areas in short, medium and long terms, and we have already started working on, on some of our quick win projects. So, you know, we're a very brand new center. Uh, the announcement came from Tanishta uh, in July. So, uh, you know, we're at early stages of setting up, but have, uh, have big plans in terms of the future directions. Um, so Construct Innovate will bring together the whole value chain to accelerate people-centric innovation in the construction and the built environment, uh, and that will drive the transition towards a sustainable society and economy. And to do that, we will rely on the active engagement of, uh, of our members and other partners and European networks of innovation clusters. So if, we, if you, anyone is interested in joining, uh, Construct Innovate, you can, uh, you can contact us through our website, constructinnovate.ie, or just email us uh, at info at constructinnovate.ie. And just before I finish up, I just want to make a, an announcement because we're currently, uh, we are currently uh, advertising the role of a center manager. It's a, it's a very exciting leadership opportunity. The person will be responsible for operational management and business development. So I think there's on, the deadline is by the end of this month. So if anyone is interested, please contact us um, and we can, we can informally chat to you about that role. Thank you. Thanks very much, uh, Magda. Um, and then we're going to move on to our next speaker and um, we'll take questions at the end, not, not during the session, okay? Um, the next speaker is uh, James Young, who's Director of Engineering Services at Evolution Innovation. So over to you, James. Um, yeah, so thanks very much for um, being invited here today um, to talk on this. So um, I suppose the main thing, Penn Modern Methods of Construction Deliver Housing Targets. So just uh, a quick note about myself. Um, I graduated from CIT, now MTU, in 2006. 
Uh, I have uh, 16 years experience in the MNC industry. I, I, I was working in the MNC industry straight out of, out of college. Uh, I'm chartered, a chartered engineer with Engineers Ireland since 2014. I've worked with over 25 MNC manufacturers in Ireland and the UK, and I've experience in working in over 15 countries in the area of MMC. In the past, um, our, our team have presented on forums such as this in relation to MMC. Uh, we've been members of various working groups such as uh, TGDE and ETAG25 um, for better frame building kits in Europe. Uh, we've been named as contributors to ACI publication documents such as um, acoustic detailing for steel frame and more recently P424 for resistance of, of light steel framing. So um, SCI Steel Construction Institute, which uh, produces many uh, technical guidance for uh, steel and cold form steel. We've presented to the National Directorate of Fire and Emergency Management in relation to fire resistance testing of MNC Category 1 and Category 2, and I'll, I'll come to the categories later on, and we're one of the founding members in the setup of MMC Ireland. Our mission um, as a company is to be recognised as the world's largest and best MMC offsite engineering consultancy, and we work hard at that. Um, so we work across a range of projects, typically low-rise panelized MMC solutions, low-rise modular uh, solutions, and then you also high-rise panelized solutions as well as high-rise modular solutions. Just quickly on, on the services within our company, we, we currently uh, cover three, three core aspects. One, uh, the first one is in structural engineering, where we specialize in the structural design of panelized and modular uh, systems. Um, across Miami, Ireland, uh, across the UK and, and other jurisdictions. Um, and one of the main other areas that we're, uh, we're getting very involved in currently is, is in the areas of, of heat transfer modeling and thermal mechanical modeling in relation to the fire protection of, of structures. We, we have a very established building physics um, department and we'll come on to the sustainability area at, uh, later on, but building physics team that does your, your U and Y value calcs, condensation risk calculations, BREEAM thermal dynamic modeling, and as well as in ratio sustainability, your EPDs and your life cycle analysis as well. And then finally, we have a very uh, established product development team. So it's pre predominantly in the area of MMC, where we assist companies get their third party certification, we assist in the development of innovative uh, products. Um, and we also uh, assist companies in the project management of their testing, such as fire, acoustic, CWCT testing, for example, on claddings, as, as well as, as many other examples. In terms of uh, Evolution's track record in, in MMC across Ireland and the UK, you know, we have a significant track record, 12,000 student beds, 8,000 hotels, 10,000 residential units, as well as educational and healthcare um, developments. Uh, and we've also been um, involved in the development of certification of, of various building systems in Ireland, probably the NSCI, we, we've assisted a lot of companies there. And across the UK, you you various other bodies that um, you may be aware of, um, BBA, SCI, uh, NHBC, OPAS, and so on. So um, MNC is a term that has been used out there in the industry, but can be vague in some areas. And a number of years ago, uh, a definition framework was established to provide clear guidance for the various types of MMC providers that are out there in the market. So they, they established um, seven categories um, that includes all various types down to your pods and 3D printing. The, per, the primary area we work in is in category one, which is your 3D solution, and category two, which is your 2D uh, solution. Then in relation to specific solicit systems that we work with, we, we again, we predominantly work in the area of, of light gauge steel and steel modular um, structures. But we, we also have experience in timber frame design and also um, ICF design as well, more recently. Just so, some examples of, of MMC projects delivered by Evolution. Again, ex examples of hospitals and student accommodation. But 
we have uh, delivered a significant amount of social housing across the country to date, um, um, both low rise and mid mid rise. So again, um, there is a track record currently there already in terms of delivering um, housing solutions um, in Ireland. In terms of what can be the ambition for MMC, so some of you may be aware of this company, Vision Modular Systems. So um, they uh, are a modular company that, that started in Ireland many, many years ago and are well established in the UK now um, and stake a claim to delivering the tallest modular buildings in the world. Um, and it's over through many years that they've developed and evolved their system um, and learned. Um, and where they have recently completed a 44 story building in Croydon in London. And just a few weeks ago, I was standing, I think, on the 45th story of their 50th, uh, 50 story modular building that's under com, underway at the moment. So um, it's, it's engineered by an Irish company, uh, Michael Hawk uh, Structural Engineers. It's delivered by a strong Irish team. So there's a very strong Irish um, element to the successful delivery of, of, of MMC in particular, uh, what vision modular systems are, are providing. So it, importance of, of third party certification. So it, it's very important to make sure that the offsite systems certified covers the details in your project and that third party certification does not guarantee project compliance. So timber frame, uh, typically have the their ISO 440 standards to follow in relation to coal form steel and, and modular suppliers they typically require an NSAI certification in Ireland. Um, there are currently almost 10 published cert certificates for panelized and modular suppliers in, in the country at present um, and there's a number um, quite a few more that are in the process um, uh, at the moment as well. Some are certified just to um, deliver two to three story housing. Others are certified up to 30 meters, um, again, depending on the level of test data that they have for the system at the time of going for certification. So as part of your certification, it's very important to have um, the, the, the required amount of testing and none more important than fire testing. So fire test data would be one of the most important aspects of any, any MMC system. So attached is an example of one NSCI cert, where it indicates a significant amount of testing that has been carried out in compliance with the applicable test standards in order to achieve NSCI certification. And it's, it, 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 it covers, it's the same for, for other aspects um, that need to be addressed. Um, just to touch on something Declan mentioned earlier. So DFMA um, is, a, is a fundamental part of, of most or all MMC um, suppliers. So DFMA and, and BIM forms part of the delivery process within MMC systems that assist in the delivery of projects. And this pro process allows MMC suppliers to optimize their throughput in their factories, increasing the number of homes that can be provided. So DFMA is about finding ways to rationalize uh, the design process, improve the selection of materials and optimize the planning and logistics of building. In particular, it exploits opportunities to design build assets using a limited variety of repeated, preferably standardized components, sub-assemblies or, or assemblies that can be beneficially that can beneficially be manufactured off-site, transported to site viably, and assembled there safely, quickly, and straightforwardly. And these components or assemblies can be just for single projects or usually with mass customization, many different projects. So what are the benefits, you, you know, factory benefits, the on-site benefits, the sustainability element benefits and the standardization without affecting the aesthetic feature of the building also benefits. And again, as I was mentioned earlier, the RIAI has just released a, a DFMA um, kind of overlay and, and a kind of a plan of work. Um, and we, we, we welcome that because it will help um, all um, elements of, the, of design teams working in MMC uh, led projects in terms of um, getting from concept to delivery um, successfully. So sustainability. So sustainability of the world around us is probably the key factor of nearly all decisions that are being made currently and for good reason, none more so than in the construction industry. 
We need to adapt to ensure the construction methods and designs are developed to ensure a more sustainable solution is provided. MMC solutions uh, with the use of DFMA and efficient factory processes can be at the forefront of sustainable construction solutions. For example, a typical MMC factory will have little waste and in their controlled environment will be able to recycle some or all the waste that they may develop. And as well as providing for the housing targets, MMC is well placed to provide a sustainable solution as well. And just for example, in, in some of one of our live projects, uh, there's, a, there's an output from one of our pre-construction models in Revit, you know, located in body carbon. This is, the, this is an area where we're really targeting and looking to understand as much as possible um, to allow us to develop design solutions that limit the embodied carbon, carbon output. We already track a significant amount of data digitally through our design processes. So we are starting to learn how to apply this at an early stage to guide us in terms of more sustainable designs and drive use of more sustainable materials. So in conclusion, in, in relation to the, to the title of, 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 of today's presentation, yes, MMC can deliver housing targets. It's important that the systems are certified and tested as required. It is key to have competent design team experience in MMC projects, and uh, there are many of those out there currently. MMC is increasingly adopted year on year, and in our view, already has a track, a significant track record in, in Ireland. Sustainability of their systems is at the forefront of all MMC providers. And as Declan mentioned, you know, all MMC providers we talked to are up for the challenge in, in ensuring that their solution is as sustainable as it possibly can. And as mentioned earlier, um, DFMA allows for mass production in terms of delivering for significant housing targets that we, we need to meet. And just finally, just to, to briefly mention that uh, MMC Ireland um, just recently set up just the coming together of um, um, various companies within the industry, just again to come together, promote the industry within the country, um, including things like Knowledge Share. And I'm sure um, there'll be a collaboration with Construct Innovate and as well as, as other elements um, such as that. So um, thank you very much. And um, Look, I'll take any questions at, at the end. Thank you. Thanks very much, James. Thanks for that. Um, I'll just introduce, if you could stop sharing, James, I'll just introduce the next uh, speaker. The next speaker is Brian Kennedy, who's Manning, Managing Director of Vision Bill. So just a, as an introduction um, and following on from, from the other presentations, um, well done to Construct Innovate. Um, Engineers Ireland for organizing this group and it's, it's great to see the numbers uh, of people interested in such a quick quick move and um, part of our industry and um, I myself I work with Vision Built Managing Director and um, been in con construction industry for about 17 years and uh, mostly in main contracting and in the last number of years and um, got more heavily involved in MMC and direct manufacture and assembly offsite. So I suppose a little bit just about, about our company vision built and what we do. Um, James mentioned the seven categories or definitions of MMC, which are quite useful. Um, and where, where vision built operate is predominantly in category one and category two, um, and also do sub, sub assemblies in category five. Category one offering is typically commercial, health, education, and some residential, while category two is mostly residential offerings, panelized systems, et cetera. Just, just our factory facilities and, and how to get a feel for how we operate. So this is our, our uh, factory in the west of Ireland. It's about 100, over 100,000 square foot um, and just allows us to manufacture our light gauge steel panelized solution and also assemble our volumetric solution. Again, just very quickly, the types of projects, just a couple of recent projects that we do, education modular um, with the Department of Education. We also do housing for various different councils um, across the UK and, and Ireland. So the current landscape and what, what the challenges that we have currently, um, like Dylan uh, mentioned, you know, give a good overview of, of what the industry looks like at the minute, you know, what's challenges we have and just some, some snapshots of what's been said in, in the papers, what's, what we know of, you know, for example, we know Solus has uh, produced this um, graph showing the, the drop off in apprenticeships. So we know there's a huge challenge with, with apprenticeships dropping off since 2005, right down to less than 500 per year. We know that the construction industry is is very unproductive, and this has been in the de decline for 
for uh, decades. This graph just shows uh, from 1990 the decline. We also know that we have to produce 33,000 houses per year um, to 2030. We know that what's happening in the industry at the minute is huge amount of retrofit schemes to happen. We know that that's fallen well short of, of where we need to be. Um, approximately 60, 70,000 retrofits to be done per year. And we're averaging only um, in around 100 to date. Um, so there's, there's huge challenges and that's all around skill shortages, around kind of them apprenticeship schemes around all of that. So what can we do, I suppose, and how can how can we do that and where MMC can, can help in that space? And um, the final interesting one, which everyone will be aware of, is the huge amount of waste that's in construction. And that waste, if we can convert even, even some 20, 30% of that 57% waste into value, um, it's going to have a huge, huge bonus for our industry in terms of cost reduction and time reduction. So the options and the next few graphs just has a look at what traditional versus MMC can look like over a project life, life cycle. So this graph here, just to describe it first, um, the red is obviously more traditional process and the green is an MMC process. So we've just shown here an overlay of, of the various different stages, um, DFM overlay of the REBA plan of work, um, which is quite a useful tool for us. There's also some amendments in here. You can see offsite assembly is brought in, substructure and superstructure is split out. So just as we work from left to right, um, stage zero to three, we know that in a more traditional um, process, um, that can take longer. So up the left-hand side is kind of the production, uh, the project duration. Um, we have to do that slightly earlier in more of an MMC world. Um, the design and procurement certainly happens earlier. So there's heavy, heavy front loading of design, which then benefits as the project goes on. So you can see the red um, a steep incline. So while that design and procurement happens through, a, through the life cycle of a project, in, in an MMC world, it happens much earlier. I'll come back to that kind of 30% time saving based um, on repetition. So as you move through component and offset assembly, this is where the advantages can can really happen. So in component and design and manufacture, that happens typically in both traditional and in an MMC world, but obviously more happens and more offsite assembly happens um, while substructure is happening on site. So very simple, simple graph just to show the, the concurrent activities that can happen. And um, when you get to site, then your superstructure happens much quicker. That's where you get the 30% 30, 30 time saving. So Declan mentioned earlier, you know, 20 to 40% typically time saving on a project. And that's where, where the big advantages can happen. And um, one of the key things that I'm going to talk about just in the next couple of slides is around what can happen with repetition and um, standard pattern designs. And not that we want to take away from the architecture we have in this company and the bespoke arrangements, but we need to look at what uh, standardization of main structural components of function and spaces that don't need to be necessarily um, architecturally um, designed from a facade point of view, but need to be really functional. Um, and then we can add on the features um, that can be a bit more bespoke, but that we keep a pattern design approach and uh, Department of Housing and other departments, um, Department of Education are leading the way in terms of this pattern design. It's just how we actually implement that into our procurement process and actually get this moving. Um, so that's that 30% additional time saving is where you obviously don't need to go through a full design and procurement process tied in with supply chain. So you, you know your suppliers, you know your lead times, and you can save all that time and cost um, of multiple bespoke designs. So just delving into a little bit more detail. So stage, stage zero to three concept through to tender. So just comparing, I suppose, uh, MMC to a more traditional process. The guys mentioned earlier um, around collaboration and how knowledge sharing is key, particularly at the start of projects. So that front loading of knowledge sharing. So rather than us working in silos, there's great clients and great design teams that know about MMC, but often need to in integrate into different systems and different manufacturers to make it really efficient and um, strong use of digital technology up on the level of partnerships, you know, based on rates, quality, not always the lowest bidder. Um, we need to be seen as quality is, is number one. Um, and that's really important for the MMC industry. Um, the knowledge sharing, as I said, and collaborative contracts. The stage four to five then is from design right through sub superstructure. So a standardized approach um, with a sustainability aspect that James mentioned earlier, 
around how that carbon footprint can be reduced, how what, what products can we use to make sure our carbon footprint is as low and our embodied carbon is as low as possible. Um, a lot of our buildings, the majority of our buildings in this country are bespoke designs. Um, so we're basically prototyping every time we go out to build a project, which is completely inefficient. And I think that's the key point around our standardized pattern-led designs and um, PDFMA platform design um, is, is a really interesting concept. Um, and I'll come back to that again. The other side of it is that in a more traditional process, it's often often difficult to get more offline work developed. So you have kind of linear programs, wherein is in a manufacturing environment, you can often do concurrent activities like the substructure um, while the work has been done in the factory. So that's where you get a lot of time saving. Final stages is the six to seven and in Ariba um, DFMA overlay, and that's commissioning the handover. So typically at the end of traditional projects, what we have is large amounts of on-site labor, uh, large amounts of on-site testing, commissioning. And in a modern methods of construction world, the digital twin aspect um, is, is really important. So we manufacture, we design for DFMA, design for manufacture and assembly. So as you design under a CAM, um, computer-aided manufacturing, you're actually developing your acid twin before you go into manufacture. So that allows um, real high accuracy in your digital twin models and um, your factory acceptance testing is done offsite. So that limits the amount of testing that's needed on site. And then you, you can focus more on smart buildings, how they operate and um, the efficiency side of it um, and that operational side of it. So an MMC approach and what, what can that look like? And um, particularly around what learnings have been had. So the UK have some very strong frameworks from a housing point of view. Um, they're based on the back of kind of two, um, two documents and two, that has been brought together by different industry groups. One is the construction playbook and one is the rule book, um, the product platform rule book. So just as an example, this is just one MMC housing framework for over 2 billion to, to deliver um, around 20,000 homes using MMC. So this is current live um, framework that's out in the UK and it's it's just based on a pattern-led approach and um, so that pattern-led approach has a number of house types that does that's designed for efficiency in both panelized cat one and cat two and um, you then get into your more bespoke arrangements or around facades various different facade types whether it's brick slip render finish and um, uh, cement fiberboard type finishes and then you have your sub assemblies your add-ons so even your your external um, areas, your, your bike shelters, your different components outside is add-ons and they're also brought into an MMC world of standardization. So it allows supply chain, MMC providers, main contractors, integrators to all come together with a kind of a pattern-led approach um, and standardization. So that certainly works here, here in Ireland. You know, this this uh, Department of Education, for example, are are, are leading the way in terms of um, frameworks for kind of standard uh, school types, which really helps manufacturing industry and gets high uh, early engagement um, and gets a, a high speed delivery. So for functional spaces, that that really works well. Um, some of the things around housing that that we feel is is really positive in Ireland. Um, there's a design manual for quality housing that was. Um, uh, published earlier this year and that's a real focus on pattern design and um, so I think the next step around that is how we actually integrate that into an MMC world and there's this huge development with with both Construct Innovate and um, the, the testing bodies the NSAI and um, the CIF and etc how there's a huge amount of work and how we can amalgamate that into a kind of a PDFMA platform design approach and um, using them pattern designs is key and I think there's, there's learnings as well from the rule book in the UK. There's a huge amount of um, effort and research gone into that and how we can standardize even various components that the industry can work together on a component led basis, um, which is going to take huge collaboration between uh, industry partners to, to get to that stage. Um, so I think there's, there's a lot of background work done. Um, the key is how we actually move this into a procurement cycle and how we actually set up frameworks that can be based on high levels of quality and um, cost reduction in terms of that standardization approach and uh, time reduction. The final piece um, is around modern methods of retrofit. So this is quite a, quite an interesting um, topic currently. It's, it's 
it's around there's, there's a huge amount of housing um, that needs to be retrofitted. We mentioned earlier that uh, 60 to 70,000 houses per year to be to be retrofitted. And um, we know this has fallen well short of its targets. And um, we know in the UK, for example, they have 27 million houses to be retrofitted. So uh, a kind of a bespoke traditional process won't allow this to scale up. And um, we're working with expert partners on quite an interesting uh, EU driven project uh, called Drive Zero which is, has brought together um, TU Dublin, Cody Architects, Westmead County Council and ourselves as manufacturer to come up with a, um, a, a product that can be used to uh, basically clad the outside of buildings um, in a more manufactured approach. So it's a, it's a panelized CAT2 system, fully finished offsite with windows installed, fi fiberboard on the outside, um, fully breathable system. Um, non-combustible system and it, it can be put up against um, the facades of, of houses. So this one is actually happening in the next few weeks. It's, it's gone through manufacturing, it's gone through the whole design process and it's going to be um, dropped in place in, in Westmead. So there's going to be huge learnings out of that and I feel that um, that, that will allow scalability into, into retrofit where, where we're challenged currently in the industry. So uh, thanks very much for your time. Uh, I'll take any questions at the end. Thanks very much. Um, we'll hand over now. The next speaker is uh, is Sean Balfe, who's Director of Agriment at the National Standards Authority of Ireland. We hand over to you. Thanks, Sean. Daniel. Um, sharing share there with you now. Um, yeah, we can okay. see. Okay, thank yeah. you. Okay, good morning, everybody. I'm, my name is Sean Balfe. I work with NSAI in the area of agriculture certification of. Um, any innovative construction products, but we're particularly busy now with uh, modern methods of construction. So just to, to, um, most modern methods of construction don't fall under a, a, a harmonized standard or European standard. So uh, the agreement certification was developed as a means to, to give third party verification of, of materials that don't fall under harmonized standards. And that's, I suppose, where we get our legal basis from. Um, the building regulation set out in Part D there what a proper material is and what uh, NSAI agreement do in, in establishing whether an innovative material or product is a proper material. So we specify the testing and uh, pr procedures to go into the manufacturer design and direction of these products. Um, as part of the assessment, we analyze the risks in the use of uh, infant construction products to this, uh, our system. Um, we identified product characteristics that to be assessed in relation to regulated requirements um, under the building regulations. Uh, develop and issue assessment procedures in consultation with the stakeholders, manufacturer, specifier, regulator, and the users, and assess and approve the product system against this procedure, taking account of requirements, uh, regulation, climatic conditions, site factors, et cetera. And we evaluate and monitor the production process to ensure consistency. So these are some of the things that we would look at over the course of the assessment of a uh, um, MMC system. Um, durability, structure, behavior, fire, thermal insulation, ventilation, justicial condensation, sound, weather tightness there. So there, there. You could all be familiar with most of those items. Um, one of the large things we have, uh, um, one of the big things is, is fire testing. Um, and obviously as buildings go higher, the, the fire testing gets more on which you need you know, walls and floors to have a greater resistance to fire. And I would see this, I know Declan spoke earlier about uh, industry collaboration. I, I, um, we'd see this as an area where we could have a lot of industry collaboration. Uh, to date, manufacturers have been commissioning their own fire tests. And I think there's a, a lot of scope there for it to come together and commission fire tests that would be uh, could be used across a number of different manufacturers. Um, and that would be indeed one of the quick wins that Magdalene was talking about. I think that it's an area that definitely could be explored to, um, to achieve some benefits to the industry. Um, so walls and floors need to be fire tested but before certification can be granted. So um, there is a, a, a lot goes into that area. And in tall buildings, we would look at uh, carrying out the BSA 414 test. That's on buildings over 18 meters high, a cladding test, and that's a particularly onerous test that I think to them carried out in the UK mainly, but we, we, we carried out uh, or looked, sought to have that carried out in a number of systems that we specified. 
Acoustic performance is another area that we look at, and this again is another area where we benefit from collaboration. Um, the Irish regulations uh, have quite stringent requirements as regards um, sound attenuation across party walls, etc. And um, so that needs to be clarified and certified, if you like, in the certificate before it can be issued. Energy efficiency and um, thermal modeling of junctions and uh, thermal performance of the building as a whole. Um, another large area that's very important with regards to energy efficiency now. And um, so that's a, we look at that quite in depth in the, of the course of the assessment. Um, weather testing, this is the CWCT test where we look at air permeability, wind resistance, water penetration, water resistance, and static and dynamic testing. Um, uh, and cladding are. Uh, um, and new cladding to see certification has to undergo this type of testing, and it's um, it's quite an onerous test for cladding to withstand. But we generally look for 60 year durability for cladding, so um, I think it's proper that we do, we do those types of tests. And we also look at the competencies of personnel in production, um, we look at the competencies of people involved in it, the material, the specifications traceability of products and materials, factory production control records, uh, we look at testing and measuring equipment, maintenance records, inspection reports, and final release down of the product and packaging and transportation, which transportation is a particularly important part when you think of the volumetric systems that we're talking about today, because some of the design criteria um, is dictated by the transportation from the factory to site. And um, we look at the design and construction, the personnel that are carrying out project specific designs, competence of those personnel, um, the method statements of development, the erection sequences, and methodologies, inspection plan, and checkpoints, and then final sign off and the records training of personnel. So as part of the housing for all, what we've given an undertaking that we were aware from the industry in general and from local authorities and engineers and architects that there was a lot of um, um, concern, I suppose, about modern method of construction in that uh, as it was put to us, um, one day you have a, a slab on a site and you come back the following day, you have a complete building and nobody knew uh, how it got there or, how, or what went into the manufacturer and, and direction of it. So NSEI, in recognition of that, and in an attempt, I suppose, to support the industry, um, we're now offering a service where we will carry out the, uh, the function of an ancillary assigned certifier, where we will follow the uh, manufacture, transportation, and erection of the, um, of the building system, and then issue a certificate of compliance on, uh, on site to satisfy the building control authority. So that's, we're offering that now to support the industry. Okay, that's the end of my presentation. I'll uh, take any questions at the end. Um, thank you. Thanks very much. Um, we'll hand over to uh, um, Sean's colleague, Pat Carolyn, who is a standards officer with the National Standards Authority of Ireland. And anyone, please feel free to type in Q&A questions as we go along as well. Thanks, Daniel. Um, you can see my screen, yeah? Yep, yep, can see it, yep. Stuff, great stuff. Okay. Uh, thanks very much for the invitation to speak today. My name is Pat Carlin. Um, I'm a chartered engineer through Engineers Ireland, and I'm currently employed with NSAI, the National Standards Authority of Ireland, as a standards officer. My main responsibilities relate to a number of technical committees we have, including aggregates, BIM, cranes, timber frame dwellings, and most recently, prefabricated dwellings, which I'll touch on later. So Sean has gone through in detail some of the workings of the certification division of NSAI. In my presentation now, I'll go through the role of the standards division of NSAI, explaining how standards are created at national and international level, and on our own interactions to date with modern methods of construction. So what is NSAI? NSAI is Ireland's national standards body and is established under the NSAI Act of 1996. Under the Act, we have a number of functions which are shared between our four main divisions. The first is standards, where our team works with relevant parties at national or international level to create, develop, and publish globally recognized standards. The second is certification, where a standard already exists. NSAI works with organizations to help them apply it. The third is legal metrology, 
which protects both Irish industry and consumers by inspecting and certifying measuring instruments used in trade to ensure that they are accurate. And the fourth is National Metrology Laboratory, which is responsible for establishing and maintaining accurate, reliable and traceable measurements for physical quantities. So NSAI standards role is to connect and facilitate stakeholders who have an interest in standardization. We act as a bridge between industry, academia, government and citizens in the development of new standards, be they national, European or international standards. In the next few slides, I'll touch upon the international organizations we are a member of relative to the construction industry. But first, a brief introduction to standards themselves. What is a standard? So a standard is a document which is voluntary in application. It is established by all interested parties. It reflects consensus. It is approved by a recognized body. It is meant for common and repeated use and it is used for guidance to support market operators. Broadly speaking, there are four main types of standards and most standards could fall into one of these four types. First up, we've product standards, which is agreements relating to the characteristics of particular products. Service standards, which provide guidance for both the service provider and the user of the service. Process standards, which give guidance and conditions and requirements which apply to the production, storage, packaging or testing of products and management standards, which help organizations to manage their activities. Management standards would be the most widely known standards as they're horizontal and their application is not confined to one particular area or sector. So why do we have standards? Well, standards can be used to support compliance with legal obligations, to help to define and promote state of the art and best practices, to increase the safety of products, processes and services, to protect consumer health, to protect the environment, to promote the interoperability of products and services, and to capture, promote, and spread new technologies and knowledge. So just to take a step back and have a look at where standards come from. Truth is they come from lots of different organizations at international, European, and national level. Actually, the majority of Irish standards are not homegrown and are developed internationally. We have European standards which come from the following organizations, each of which NSAI is Ireland's national member of. We have CENELEC, which is the European Committee for Electrotechnical Standardization, which deals specifically with electrical and electrotechnical standardization. We have ETSI, which is the European Telecommunication Standards Institute, which deals specifically with electronic communications. And we have SEN, the European Committee for Standardization, which encompasses virtually all other areas, including standards related to the construction industry. Perhaps it's a good point just to point out the BSI still remain a member of each of these organizations and are under the same obligations as NSAI. At international level, the equivalent organizations are ISO, the International Organization for Standardization, IEC, the International Electrotechnical Commission, and ITU, the International Telecommunications Union. So there's agreements within the World Trade Organization that recognize the work of these organizations as a tool to support global trade. There's also agreements between the European and international standard organizations with regards to how they collaborate and to ensure that no conflicting standards exist. And again, these agreements are in place just to reduce technical barriers to the global trade of goods and services. So this slide, just, this slide summarizes how we manage the interplay between these organizations and our national committees. In NSAI, we have a number of committees made up of technical experts. These are mapped to the European and international committees who develop standards in their area of expertise. Our national committees would comment and vote on international standards at various stages as they go through the drafting process. As members of SEN, SENELEC and ETSI, we are obliged to adopt every European standard as an Irish standard i.s.en and withdraw any conflicting national standards. So it's very important that we are involved in the de development of international standards. We have systems in place to support the flow of information between our national committees and the mirror international committees. And our main priority is to engage internationally and place Irish stakeholders at the center of international standards development. So a technical, sorry. A technical committee will be made up of various interested stakeholders, each volunteer and their expertise to support standardization activities. A chairperson will be appointed by the committee members and NSAI will provide a secretariat service to facilitate the process and support the committee. 
So a typical committee would involve consumer bodies, certification bodies, professional institu institutions, standards users, educational bodies, etc. So just a quick recap on all that. Standards enable industry to demonstrate compliance with the legislative requirements, for example, some provisions of the building regulations, to run an important reference for clients, specifiers, designers, and builders, and their use and upkeep help keep pace with technical innovation. So the recently formed NSAI TC150 is the recently established National Committee for Prefabricated Buildings. The initial scope of this committee was to monitor the work of the recently formed ISO TC59 Subcommittee 19, Prefabricated Buildings. Work at the, the, the initial scope, the ISO committee was set up by China, the China Secretariat and the work at this level is still at the very early stages to still review an existing data standards and developing key definitions. NSAI TC150 currently just consists of seven members from key industry players and our plan is develop this, to develop this committee by a liaison with the Construction Technology Centre to identify any gaps in standardisation relating to modern METS construction and develop a work programme for this committee. NSAI standards approach to MMC to date has been to wait and see. A feedback from industry is that the certification scheme currently in place and outlined previously by Sean is working quite well, but we are ready to act in this area of industry feel there is a need for standardisation. Before I wrap up, I'll take this opportunity to invite you to get involved in standardization. You might consider participating with a prefabricated buildings committee, NSAI TC150, or any of our other committees relating to construction. There is a registration form on the NSAI website for registering your interest in any specific technical committee. Other committees that may be of interest to this audience include NSAI TC8, which is dealing with timber frame dwellings, which is currently carrying out a review of IS440, which was previously mentioned in one of, by one of the presenters, NSAI TC15, which is dealing with the current revision of the Euro codes. And just to note, the participation in our committees is considered as CPD by a number of professional associations, including Engineers Ireland. So thank you very much. I hope you got some from the very brief presentation. If you have any questions, we can take them at the end, or you can email me to my email address that's on the screen. So thank you all very much for your time, and I'll now pass it back to Daniel. Thank you. Thanks very much, Pat. Thanks a million. Um, move on to our next presenter. Um, next presenter is Connor Taft, who's Managing Director of Home Bond. Okay. Um, good morning, everybody, and thank you. Thank you very much for the opportunity to present today. So I'm going to, uh, I suppose, look at, I think that's on the screen at the moment, I'm going to look at um, a number of issues in relation to MMC, I suppose, and where they fit in with home bond. Um, I suppose, just to explain from the outset, we have two hats on. We're an insurance company providing latent defects insurance. And we also operate as a design certifier, whether design certifier or um, a design certifier. So in terms of... Um, Look at design inspection and auxiliary starts just from our point of view from insurance and from the building control perspective um some other developments in the market of mmc the um, a standard that the bre are looking at maybe um they'll talk about that later on a scheme in england to do with quality insurance uh obviously nsai sean bank and i can have spoken with it already and then an initiative from home bond called build smart to provide more information to the stakeholders in the industry and then lastly, just um, it's important that everybody can understand the risks in relation to MMC and then some key considerations. So we provide latent defects insurance for low rise, medium rise and high rise apartments, duplexes, houses. And obviously, um, MMC construction falls within what we insure. Um, we provide a first party policy. So when we're taking on projects for, for risk, we have to look at the design of those projects, whether it's standard construction, or whether it's MMC type of construction. Uh, we have to look at documents, we have to look at drawings, we have to get certification, we have to get commissioning certs. So we apply the same principles for an insurance project that we're taking on board, just the same as we do if we're working as an assigned certifier. And, and that's where certification is very, very important for us because we require systems and products to 
comply with the standards, harmonized standards, generally speaking, and then third party certification for other products and systems that fall outside of that. So when we issue our insurance policy, it can be for 10 or 12 years. And we have to make sure that the systems and products and buildings comply with the building regulations. And obviously there's um, less risk of claims occurring. So James spoke earlier on about the framework for MMC. Um, as regards the projects that we would have insured at the moment, we have um, every, every type of project basically, except for category four and category seven. So we have 3D modular, we have 2D uh, primary structural elements, we have pre manufactured components, we have non-structural assemblies, uh, traditional building products. Um, and you can see, Categories one, two, three, four, and five are primarily off-site manufacturing. So we have to consider the competency, I suppose, of the designers for these systems. We have to look at who's manufacturing these systems and these products. Where are they coming from? What sort of um, credibility is there? And making sure that everything is acceptable to, to ourselves and also to our underwriters. And then if you look at category six and seven, you can obviously have some additional work done on site. So that's the, the definition framework. In terms of um, what we look for, I suppose, on the right-hand side, you can see a list of high-level um, items that we consider. So obviously, a design team meeting is required with the design team at a very, very early stage, looking at the design approach, drawings, and specifications. And primarily, we want somebody to take overall responsibility for the building. So while you might have MMC being manufactured off-site, the design certifier is the person that has a responsibility to make sure that the overall design complies with the building regulations. So the design certifier has a big role to play here because they have to understand the design of the building. And particularly if it's MMC, whether it's 2D or 3D, they have to, to know behind the scenes what's going on. In terms of ancillary certs, then, what certificates do you get? Like, how far do you go? Do you look for um, all certificate for every element of the MMC construction, or do you look for high-level certification? So it's very, very important. An inspection plan has to be drawn up, and, and that's whether we're doing insurance or whether we're doing building control. So how do you inspect MMC construction ongoing on site? If it's 3D modular and it's coming in on the back of the truck, there's very little that you can actually inspect on site, except the cladding or the roof covering or whatever the foundations before it goes in. But what do you need in terms of MMC from the manufacturer to demonstrate that the works that have been incorporated into that 3D unit or 2D unit comply with the regulations? And don't forget, we all have to sign or somebody has to sign a certificate of compliance design and we have to make sure that everything is designed properly. In terms of design checks then, so. This is just a document from England looking at uh, what sort of design checks we should have or expect to see. And you can see on the, on the left hand side, you could have level one, level two, level three or level four. So as the complexity of the building increases, you go from self-checking essentially to third party checking. And that's something that we're looking at now. So, for example, with a multi-story building, obviously, you'd want an extended check to be done. and and make sure that everybody's competent to that. In terms of risk groups, then, where, where do those design level checks apply? And again, this is from England. So if you're looking at two and three, four-story houses, your design check level one and two, whereas if you go up to uh, apartments up to 15 storeys, your design level check three. So it's important that the design is looked at at a very, very early stage, particularly for MMC construction, because once design sign-off takes place and it goes to manufacturing stage, nothing is going to change and those units are going to be made and if the design is incorrect well then how many units are going to be made incorrectly and how is that rectified in terms of ancillary certs again what do we have to get and this is a matter of opinion uh, so depending on your category one two three four five six or seven you might have to get uh, quite a lot of ancillary certs to satisfy compliance you know if you're signing off as the design certifier or if you're signing off as the assigned certifier, um, you only get one chance at this. So at the very, very start, you have to set out um, the ground rules. You have to notify the different parties. 
and you have to, um, I suppose, be realistic and and um, get what you can get. Don't ask, for, don't ask for something that you can't get. When construction comes along then, how do we inspect MMC? So again, it, it, depending on whether it's modular, whether it's uh, 3D modular, 2D modular, or individual components, we have to have a means of doing our inspections, recording, taking photographs, uh, performance testing. Uh, Sean Balfe mentioned earlier on about sound testing and fire testing. We have to look for evidence of those reports. And then, of course, the ancillary certificates. So um, before we can sign off, we have to have a suite of certificates. And you have to know, um, I suppose, who to ask for these, where to get them, uh, and what to get. What happens if we have non-compliance? So if we have MMC 2D or 3D on site and we come across a non-compliance issue, say that the product got damaged in transport or installed correctly, how is that fixed? Uh, where do we go? What's the role of the manufacturer in terms of uh, fixing that or assisting with further compliance and certification? If we have to do remedial work, um, what's the implications there? So we, we kind of have to look ahead and see and plan and make sure that all the elements are buildable and we don't want to see problems on site and uh, problems with it. So timber frame is one of the categories, uh, falls under one of the categories of MMC. And I suppose we have IS4440, as mentioned by Sean Balfe earlier on. And I'm on the standards committee in NSCI for this. And I particularly like this standard because it sets out a lot of the design parameters that the designer has to look at. So if you're acting in the role of the design certifier, you, you know where you stand and, and these are the things that you have to look for. It also looks at documents that have to be provided and it gives a schedule. So again, you're clear if you're working with timber frame, these are the documents we have to get. These are the details we have to see on site. Um, and there's quality control instructions for subcontractors and follow on trades. So materials, again, there's a schedule of materials and you have to, the manufacturer has to satisfy themselves that they're supplying the right materials. You might have to look for certification or documentation to satisfy yourself. And again, there's an exclusion standard. So in terms of MMC, I suppose, if you're looking at light gauge steel and other precast systems and products and that, it would be very, very useful if there was a standard, an overarching standard that would give guidance to the industry in terms of high level requirements. One of those standards that I think is under development in England at the moment is called the BRE Product Standard, um, BPS 7014. And it mirrors, I suppose, what Sean mentioned early on in terms of third party um, assessment of systems and that. And there's a schedule, a list of items there that you can see in your screen, much like what Sean showed earlier on in terms of agreement certification. And maybe this is the way forward for for modular systems, particularly 3D modular systems, to have a standard that can be developed that is accessible to all the stakeholders so that everybody is working off the same uh, wish list, if you want to call it, and everybody knows what to ask for. Um, England, I suppose, because of, James mentioned this earlier on, because of the, the volume of MMC projects in England, like Cage Steel in particular, um, the mortgage industry and landlords and owners wanted some sort of insurance. So they set up this um, built property assurance scheme, BOPAS, in England, where uh, systems and manufacturers can get accredited. And then you can log on and look at their database and you can see where projects have been constructed with particular types of systems around England. Uh, we don't have anything like that in Ireland because the volume is not here. Maybe this might come in the future, but that's, I suppose, a good place to go if you're looking for some information on MMP. Um, Sean mentioned earlier on their guide to agreement certification for modern methods of construction, and we would support that as well. So in terms of agreement certification in home bond, we obviously look for Irish agreement certification for products. Um, there's an issue at the moment, obviously, with the acceptability of English BBA agreement certificates or agreement certificates from other jurisdictions. So you have to be very, very careful when you're looking at agreement certification. Is it suitable for Ireland? Does it cover the Irish building regulations? And again, we support a lot of the work that NSBI do and uh, I suppose they, they operate a filter 
for the Irish construction industry and assess products and systems. And therefore, we get confidence from that. So one initiative we have now to make information available to the industry is Build Smart. And we've developed um, an app that can be downloaded on Google Play or the App Store. And if you see on the left hand side, it's got 10 features. So obviously, the first one there is the e-manual, which we've updated, and it's got six supplements. But the one that's relevant for um, MMC probably is number five there, 3D View. So we've got agreement from some providers to give us their uh, drawings in terms of systems and products that they have and make them available under 3D View. And in, in that way, people can then see what systems are out there and essentially we're telling people, well, these are systems that we have insured. We're not certifying them, but we're just telling you these are systems that have come to us and, and they're on some of our projects. And these are the details that they're provided. So this um, app and web reader is available to our members free of charge. We're doing a launch in the next month or so. It will be open to anybody in the industry for a fee. And we'll be updating information and building on the content. So, for example, you can access different types of tools there on number eight, how to comply. You can read magazines. You can check products on the number four. You can check FAQs on the number three. You can research the technical guidance documents on the two. And you can do searches across all these functions. So this will help people going forward and making sure that everybody has information. And that's just the flyer for it that we have. And if anybody wants more information, you can contact Amy in our office or business at home on that IE. Understanding risks then, just on anything up here, um, in terms of MMC, this is a, a study that was done, I, I think, on behalf of Marsh, who are an insurance company, a global insurance company, uh, undertaken by the University of Cambridge. And they researched among different stakeholders, different uh, interpretations of risk that they might have for MMC type of construction. And you can see the five headings there on the screen, design, manufacturing, uh, transportation, construction, and operations. And where those particular stakeholders felt there was a risk in terms of using MMC, shall we say. And I'm not going to read them all out, but again, this was just a research done at university level on behalf of our uh, global insurance company. And when they looked then at particular areas within MMC, for example, modular and CLT there, they, they looked at uh, ranking those risks in terms of high, medium and low priority. So again, this is mirrored, I think, across the industry from different studies that have gone on. It's not rocket science, but it's just indicating um, to everybody here, I suppose, today that when you are looking at MMC, there are risks associated with that form of construction from a design perspective, from a buildability perspective, from inspections on site, from certification and from an insurance perspective. And we must uh, look at all of those risks and mitigate those risks in terms of what our involvement is. Just finally finishing up here, what are the key considerations for all stakeholders? Um, go back to what Sean mentioned earlier on in terms of certification and that for products and systems, we look, must look for CE marks, third party certification, uh, certificates, DOPs, test reports. We have to train staff, whether that's our designers, whether that's our inspectors, whether that's the manufacturers in the, fact, in the plant. Uh, traceability of materials is huge because we're now making things off-site. We can't see them um, being put together on-site, so we have to know where they came from. What procedures do people have for defective and correct product? Because if something goes wrong on an MMC in terms of 3D or 2D, uh, the implications could be significant because now you could have multiple houses or multiple buildings affected where something is wrong. Uh, and we don't want that. Awareness of standards, ongoing CPD is, is a huge big issue as well. And greater collaboration is required between stakeholders because unless there's greater collaboration um, and a better understanding of the, of the process and the risks, th there will be issues going forward and, and everybody has to go together. So th the big downfall, I suppose, for MMC at the moment is that there's limited lost data from insurers in relation to MMC. I know timber frame, uh, there's a lot of units registered with home bond. Uh, we don't have uh, any particular lost data associated with that. But on the other forms of MMC, the lost data just is not there because those systems have not been used. So therefore it's harder to quantify risks. 
and therefore insurers um, might not be uh, acceptable to take everything on. And then very, very lastly, at the end of the day, we have to sign off. Uh, the construction has to be completed and it has to be hand over, hand over. So what do we need to get if we're adopting or using MMC in terms of construction on our sites? What are the certificates? What are the manuals we have to get? What backup do we need? And again, if we don't know um, the answers to that, well, then potentially we may have some problems in the future. Okay, that's me finished, and uh, I'll take any questions later on. Thank you. Thank you very much, Connor. Um, so we'll move on to our final speaker, who is James Duncan, who's Head of Construction and Environment at the Building Research Establishment. So over to you, James. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is James Duncan. I am head of construction environment and one of the other teams I have picked up recently is fire safety and investigation at BRE. So I look after a team of about 65 consultants, technicians and researchers. Um, and we well, what I'm going to talk today about is sort of the history of MMT in the UK, lessons learned that could be relevant for Ireland. Um, and I'm going to sort of preface and start off with the fact that I am not an expert in Ireland per se. So my colleague John White, who's our general manager in BRE Global Ireland, is best person to speak to when we're talking about Irish regulations. Um, really quickly, I'm just going to, it wasn't something I've got in my slides, um, but I'm just going to mention BPS 7014 um, is something that BRE has actually withdrawn out of the market, um, why we review it for in further um, detail. Uh, it's predominantly because I think trying to apply a single standard to MMC as a market is, is an incredibly big challenge, and I'll sort of touch on that later in my presentation. So, BRE, who are we? Um, we were founded in 1921, and we're the largest UK charity dedicated to um, research and development and education um, and testing within the within the UK. And we're structured as a profit for purpose, um, which is really, really unique. And it gives us the ability to be able to remain impartial. Um, we have some other big um, products, um, so LPCB, which is the Red Book, and BRIAM, which I'm sure a lot of people will be familiar with. Um, and SQL has recently just been rebranded as BRIAM Infrastructure. We're based in Watford, just outside London. And one thing that's really unique about us is that everything that we do of our testing houses, so from fire testing, acoustic testing, we've got the largest structures lab in Europe, um, that's all based on one site. So when we're looking at getting products to be certified, actually there's some really big logistics savings by using us when we look at that. So, the history of MMC in the UK, it's a it, its a huge topic um, and I'm, I'm not going to be able to get through it in the time that we've got, but I want to point you in the direction of a really detailed um, report produced by the NHBC Foundation. Um, until I sort of started looking at this subject, I didn't realise this existed, so I really want to sort of point it out to everyone, it's a it's good, good read. Um, it takes basically um, steel, concrete, timber um, as construction methods. Um, and it looks at where MMC approaches have been taken in from sort of origins, applications, innovations, and the future. Um, and they define that as the early 20th century is where the origins are, applications are the 40s and 50s, innovation is the 90s, and then we look into the future, which is 2020s. MMC has got predominantly a, a bad reputation historically with consumers and that's predominantly because when we looked at um, MMC we were looking at prefabrication post World War One and World War Two, and surprisingly enough similar stories to what we've got today challenges around materials workforce labor um, skill shortages we then come into the 60s and 70s and this is when we were looking at um, large scale prefabricated developments um, sort of in city center urbanization and high rise um, and this really damaged the reputation of MMC. A good sort of historical sort of reference point is 1968 with Ronan Point um, and this was an accident that uh, BRE investigated um, at the time. It was a 22 story tower block um, in East London um, and due to a gas explosion on the 18th floor, it caused the death of four people and injured 17. Um, but as you can see from the image, it, it, it's quite a drastic um, accident to have happened, especially I think it was only two days old when the accident happened or had only been opened um, for two days. Uh, it was the first sort of 
wake up call in my opinion to affordable um, prefabricated sort of housing and that the whole requirement for standards in this area. So some useful terminology, hopefully everyone knows what MMC stands for, um, but I am going to touch a little bit on the framework um, categories. Um, and it's really interesting seeing the previous speakers really emphasize where they sit within the landscape. Um, so this is something that was MHCLG, and um, now sort of DELA sort of did this with, through an industry working group. And it's really started to cement where suppliers and, and different members of the community fit. Um, DFMA I'm not, and PMV, I'm not really going to touch in, in too much detail. But again, design for manufacturing and assembly is really critical as we start looking at how we start working together. So just the actual categories themselves, um, you've got category one, which is volumetric, category two, which is panelized um, pre-manufacture, so things like SIPs panels, um, category three, which is pre uh, composite, with component pre-manufacturing, um, category four, additive manufacture, so 3D printed concrete, something we're starting to see come through our testing labs quite a bit, and category five is your pods, um, which we've all seen go into residential property. Um, or developments. Category six and seven are a little bit different, and this is where the work takes place actually on site. Um, so things like sit, um, uh, you've got brick slips, um, and it's making the actual workforce more efficient on site. Um, and category seven is a little bit more innovative, and that's using uh, robotics or um, 3D scanning um, and digital platforms, really. So some massive Prop tech startups are really starting to make inroads in with category seven. When we look at what's driving this with the industry um, and where the government drivers have been in the UK, it was predominantly majorly kicked off with the industry transformation strategy in 2016, um, which in our sort of 170 million pounds worth of investment to encourage the uptake of MMT in, pub in the public sector. Um, and a part of this funding was dedicated to the Construction Innovation Hub, which um, has produced some really valuable documents and, and material for the industry. Um, going in through into 2018, you had the Hackett Report, which goes further on into the Building Safety Act and that golden thread and being able to understand, as we heard earlier, where the products have gone through the whole value chain. And then finally, you've got the Transforming Public Procurement that's due out in 2023, which is taking the four individual acts and trying to streamline them into a, a more um, succinct act, which enables all and small companies to be able to be involved in large procurement programs. So the actual offsite industry itself, um, and one of the, the, if we look at this the other way and why the industry has got involved and drives it itself is we've got a massive skill shortage. And I was gonna go through some facts and figures, but I think the previous slides covered it really well, especially around apprenticeships. Um, but we need to look at moving from siloed to more collaborative blended roles. Um, and that's part of that digital industry transformation. Um, and if we look at our sort of peers within other industries, um, we need to be taking lessons learned from the automotive and aviation industry. A lot has been done in those areas. And predominantly, it's, it's about mitigation of risk or liabilities and being able to actually bundle that together. There's been real inroads um, for us as suppliers into projects um, through much more succinct public sector procurement. Um, so we're looking at programs of works rather than individual projects and frameworks. So this is linking into um, projects such as the pr prisons or educational projects, which are now replicating their design more and more as opposed to those one-off bespoke projects. Um, examples of useful tools that can be utilized, again, they've been touched on earlier today, but the Value Toolkit by the Construction Innovation Hub, the Construction Playbook, um, and the MMC Definition Framework. And obviously, COVID-19 has been a massive accelerator to us moving and talking about a lot, a lot of this today. Um, the fact that we're all today on, T, on I think, Zoom today um, is just a real demonstrator that actually collaborative technologies that were nice to have previously are now absolutely necessary. So what does BRE do? BRE provides expert advice and tools, testing, and that's predominantly where my team sits within the assurance division of BRE, certification, training, and research. And this is a constantly evolving cycle. Within testing, um, we provide a whole host of suites of testing. Um, and this is 
sort of broken into two parts. We have our testing that then ultimately leads into certification. So um, tests such as the 8414 tests, um, which are very prescriptive um, and go through the, a very accredited, or they go through the accredited paths. Um, and then within my teams of construction environment and fire safety, it's more the bespoke projects. Um, so we're looking at research projects for DLUC, which are um, around MMC methodologies and having a look at how those actual systems perform and that's just providing early stage research there aren't standards for us to test against and that's this these early projects are starting to prove testing methodologies that can be used in the future if i talk more about the construction part of what testing we're able to provide obviously being outside of fire there's a little bit more bespoke elements to it we're looking at displacement transducers, load cells, accelerometers, strain gauges. Um, and one of the real interesting parts of it has been di digital image correlation. So WikiHouse project is a residential sort of startup project that's gone through our structures lab recently. And we have to do some more robust testing that looks at actually how the connection joints between the modules perform or the racking tests and how they perform. So using new technologies, we're able to then track the picture on the left is individual black dots and how they move. And then we can exaggerate that movement um, through software, which shows where the strain, pressure and tension is providing confidence into the market. So the lessons learned and what today's really about um, is sort of what can be taken in and how we take this forward. So there are a lot of proprietary systems in the market and there's a lack of interoperability between um, the different parts in the market and I think that's what I would like to try and say is the biggest challenge as a test house we obviously have NDAs in place um, and we see customers testing very similar items and when we're working towards net zero and trying to accelerate how we achieve our goals being able to have our data openly available and shared is fundamental to the success of MMC platforms really link into um, groups of people working together to create products and systems that link with each other. And there's the Innovation Park at BRE, which has um, a really good case study, um, which is the Seismic One project, which is not just the little video that's just played there is Tata Steel's Seismic um, cassette system. Um, and again, that links into DFMA and how that's been designed digitally and how that all links together. So platforms enable scale which starts unlocking the commercial barriers that we've had because testing and what I tried to emphasize earlier is isn't cheap um, and being able to look at every different different permeable mutation of that becomes quite challenging finally just to finish up on um, is to mention that we do have BRE Global Island um, and these services um, that I've talked about are all available through John White's team um, but we look at how we create ETAs um, and then the process that's involved in that. I'm, I'm just conscious of time, so I won't go into that in too much detail, um, but it is something actually being able to have technical competency and credibility in helping produce the ETAs eventually um, to bring in voluntary CE marking, um, which then links into the sort of insurance industry, being able to actually have confidence, as we heard earlier with Home Bond, being able to say, this is we have confidence in this product, not only today, but if we have an escape of water event nine years into the policy, will we be able to repair it? And what does that look like for ourselves? So um, hopefully that covers everything. So thank you very much. Thank you very much. Um, I'm just going to hand over very quickly to back to Magda and then um, to Sean to, to go through your questions. OK, thank you very much. Thanks very much, Dan, and thanks a million to all the fantastic presentations. Very informative, and hopefully everyone uh, everyone got out of the presentation as much as I did. So I just want to quick uh, I want to quickly run uh, another poll. There are only two questions. Just let me share the screen. Um, so again, if you can open the VVox app uh, or just scan that uh, QR code, and the the session will start now um, so the first question is has your level of knowledge of mmc of modern methods of construction improved based on this webinar and you can answer yes no and you may not be sure what the answer is uh, fantastic so the the majority of people 
uh, know more after those presentation. That's great, that's great feedback. Um, okay, and we'll move on to the final question now. Uh, has your level of understanding of the issues relating to adoption of MMC improved based on this webinar? And again, that that's very clear what the, the issues are. Uh, now looking at the cloud, word clouds uh, in the first poll that we run, it seemed like people were well aware of the, of the issues that are here, particularly in Ireland. So thanks very much. 